All right, it's good to, good to be with you. Uh, I, I, it would be nice to greet each of you individually, uh, but uh, I have greeted most of you before, and it's, it's good to see faces I know. Jonathan Steeds, it's good to see you again, brother, and, uh, and uh, renew some fellowship with you. Um, we are in the study of wisdom literature, and in the process, we are looking right now at Proverbs. This will be our last session on Proverbs. Um, what we're doing here, it's, it's, it's really difficult to teach Proverbs as, as, a, as a book. It would be difficult to teach through Proverbs. One of my professors, who, with whom I had two courses in Proverbs, um, said he would never try to preach expositorily through chapters, especially chapters 10 to 31. There would be passages where you could, but it, it would be very difficult. Rather, it's, it's much more consistent with the nature of the book itself to look at, as we looked last week at the instruction genre in chapters 1 to 9, and then went on into the, the, uh, the wise uh, person. What, 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 do, what does a wise person look like? Today, we're going to look at <laughs> um, five different characters in the book of Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews, where did that come from? In the book of Proverbs, and uh, and look at their characteristics as they can be identified in the book of Proverbs. So once again, we're going to share the, uh, the uh, document. I have made that available, I think. Have I not made the uh, document available to the group? Um, let's see, share now, and I want... Microsoft Word. Today, we'll be looking at five different characters. Um, I assume that you can see the document now. Yes, sir. That, yes, sir. We can okay, see it. Good. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful when technology does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> um, let me get rid of the styles here. Um, wait. Um, we'll look at, at five characters. We're, immediately, we'll look at the, at the simpleton or the gullible. Um, that will need, all of these terms will need uh, definition. We'll look at three kinds of fool, and then we'll look at the scoffer. Um, the, uh, these are, are, with the wise, these are six characters that show up repeatedly in the book of Proverbs. And once you begin to understand their character, you can understand what Proverbs is saying about them. So um, just to read the paragraph that's at the top of the screen there, the second moral category, and, and these are moral categories, they're not intellectual categories. That's an important addition to make to what we will say. Um, the second moral category in the book of Proverbs is the category of simplicity. The verb form from which the Hebrew noun derives, pata, means to be simple, naive, to be gullible, to be foolish. Um, and in that regard, you might consider Samson as the, uh, the original gullible man. Um, <laughs> we have a character in, in, in uh, American culture named Jethro Bodine. Jethro Bodine was uneducated. He had no real um, um, no real insight into life. He was he was young and foolish, and and Jethro Bodine had a had a basic. Well, I, I've actually told you about the wrong person. Um, Go, uh, uh, Gomer Pyle was his name. Same kind of character. No education. Not very smart. And Gomer Pyle had a basic piece of wisdom. All of you will know either from similar characteristics, similar sayings in your own culture or from just observance of life. And that is, Gomer Pyle said, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, and so uh, if you don't learn from being fooled, 
then you're a greater fool than the fool who, who fooled you. And so, so Samson is fooled three times. Uh, Samson is not as um, wise as Gomer Pyle was. <laughs> uh, uh, Delilah fools him three times, and he can't see that she has no interest in his good. Original, go up, original in quotation marks indicates that I'm not trying to press original to its, its absolute sense, but he is kind of the pattern of gullible people in the Bible. The student must not confuse this with being intellectually simple. We're not talking about people who are just not very smart in terms of facts and data. Um, this person may be quite intelligent. Rather, the simpleton is one who is usually young, who is easily led, he's naive, either into wisdom or into folly. Uh, so I've called him the original open-minded man. He's open to any influence and uh, can be led in any direction, depending on the people you uh, surround him with. His character, his moral life, he goes astray. And you see we're having to go outside of Proverbs to some degree, but there are wisdom influences throughout the Bible. Uh, he, he goes astray. He prefers folly to wisdom. It's, folly is just easier. And the simpleton, the gullible man, likes the easy way. He doesn't want to go through lots of steps to do something if he's going to have to take a, do a lot of, uh, of, um, of different steps to achieve a goal. He's just going to take the easy way and never go that direction. He's easily lured into temptation. I, I really hate teaching this material because I see so much of myself in it. In it. Uh, he is wayward. He is self-satisfied. Um, he doesn't like discipline. None of us likes discipline, but some of us will embrace various disciplines in order to achieve a goal. Uh, so if you're trying to keep your heart healthy, then you will embrace the, um, the discipline of exercise. Um, and, and that's a good thing. But the simpleton just doesn't like discipline in any, in any form, whether it's corrective or whether it is punitive. He doesn't like discipline in any way. His thought life, he's gullible. He'll believe anything. Um, Last week, I had the Logos document up. I should have had, I, I was not thinking ahead. One of the characteristics of a simpleton is he doesn't think ahead. And so I didn't prepare with Logos so I could highlight these or, or ho hover over these references and, and let you see the biblical text. He's imprudent. Prudence is a category that we don't use much in American English anymore, but prudence looks to the future and sees trouble coming and makes preparation for it. Um, the, the simpleton is imprudent. He, he, he doesn't realize anything about the future. Uh, the future is going to take care of itself. Ho, ho, it's all fine. It's going to work out. And then he gets into trouble. Uh, he's undiscerning. <clears throat> I cannot say. He sent, it's not a matter of being undiscerning about good and evil. He's undiscerning about the difference between the good and the best. And one of our professors at Dallas Seminary, when I was a student, um, said, the good can become the enemy of the best. Uh, there are lots of good things to do in life. What we must choose, what we must seek, and the simpleton doesn't bother with, is he will settle for the good, but, but give up the best in order to get the good. Um, he lacks sense. He's incautious. He's untutored. And he's incapable of seeing the consequences of his actions. <laughs> uh, let me do look at that one. I think that might well be a, a fairly important verse to look at. Uh, Proverbs 22, 3. Um, a sensible person sees danger and takes cover, but the inexperienced, and that's for this Bible translation that I have, that's the simpleton. The inexperienced keep going and are, are, are punished. Um, 
So one of the things uh, that you have to confront, I, I didn't, I didn't make this point, I think. Uh, this, this is the lot of every child. Every child is simple. Um, one, of the, one of the functions of parenting is to take the simplicity out of the child and, and, and lead the child toward wisdom. And so one of the things I've got to do in, in training a child take away their gullibility, Don't, teach them not to believe everything everybody says, teach them prudence, start looking out for the future. So see the consequences of your actions and prepare, choose actions that are going to give you consequences you're, you're going to be satisfied with, not consequences that you will, that you will rue. He lacks uh, sense, so we must teach him sense. He's incautious. My mother used to tell me in a, in a slightly dangerous position, a place, she would say, now be careful, watch out, watch where you're going. But she didn't tell me what to watch for. <laughs> and so I, I remained incautious in many kinds of circumstances. I had to learn where to be cautious and where not to be cautious, though my mother was trying to make me cautious. She didn't tell me. Okay, now how, what, what am I to look out for and what arrangements can I make to avoid this, this uh, dangerous situation? And this is one of the things we must do with children. We must teach them where danger lies and where, uh, how, uh, with caution, they may avoid the danger. The consequences of this character, his waywardness will murder him. And that's specifically the Hebrew word that's used for for. Uh, his the outcome of his life. It will murder him. Uh, so if I leave this simpleton in his simplicity, if he lives long enough, it, 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 he may not live long enough, but if, but it is, so in his simplicity, he may get into trouble and be killed because of that. He will become a fool. If you don't surround the simpleton who is easily guided with wise people, the effect of that will be, will be he will choose folly because ch folly is always easier than wisdom. Wisdom asks people to delay gratification. Um, and the, the simpleton doesn't like to delay gratification. He wants gratification now. And, if, and since folly is easier and more attractive, he will be he will become a fool if, he's, if he lives long enough. He will be constantly in trouble. <laughs> there, there's no way for him to live but in trouble uh, throughout his life. And he will never really understand why he is in that position. See, he will be constant. Well, we read that. The challenge to the naive is he must learn wisdom. Proverbs 8, 5. Um, Let's see, Proverbs. I can't make this Bible turn. Um, <laughs> Proverbs, oy vey. There it is. Proverbs 8, 5. Learn to be shrewd, you who are inexperienced. Develop common sense, you who are foolish. He must learn common sense. The, the, fool, the, the simpleton has no common sense. Um, there is nothing quite so uncommon as common sense. <laughs> um, he can learn wisdom from the book of Proverbs. That's one of the goals of the book of Proverbs. When Proverbs 1.4 uh, is part of the statement of the goals of the book, the purposes of the book, and it's to give discretion to the to to the simple um, he may learn wisdom through the statutes of the lord psalm 197 or from the word of god psalm 119 130 he will learn wisdom by practicing wise behavior um, so one of the tasks of a parent in raising a child is to give the child 
uh, instruction and wise behavior and lead the child to practice that wise behavior. You don't have to be wise to practice wisdom. But if you practice wisdom, you will become wise uh, by seeing fools punished. Proverbs 19, 25, 21, 11. This is behind um, the biblical uh, uh, demands for execution of idolaters. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the important passages in Deuteronomy is in chapter 12, where, uh, is it chapter 12? Chapter 13, where you uh, find a false prophet and, a, and, a, and a, a village starts following the false prophet. What you are to do to the village once they have, have embraced the false prophet is you go investigate whether this is, in fact, a false prophet and it, it's leading the people into idolatry. You investigate that, and if this is true, then you, you kill all the people in the village, you, you gather all their belongings into the city square and burn them, and you, and you destroy the village, leaving it a ruin, so that all Israel will come to fear, uh, to learn wisdom, uh, from, from this point of view, fearing the Lord, and so you learn wisdom from this. Um, the, uh, the kinds of fool that we will look at shortly can't learn anything, for the most part. They can't learn anything from from seeing the, the wicked punished, but the simpleton can, and so that is a worthy goal. And then finally, by welcoming discipline and reproof, the one thing none of us welcomes pretty much is discipline and reproof. <laughs> I, I don't like to be reproved, but I must learn to value that because I will never learn wisdom unless I do. He must leave his folly, and that's the hardest thing for him to do. He will, he will leave folly by seeing the scorner punished, Proverbs 19.25, and by abandoning his simple-minded ways. Um, but he has to see the value of wisdom. Part of what's going on in the opening nine chapters of Proverbs is its, its instruction, at what Bruce Waltke called uh, primary education in wisdom. It's instruction for the simpleton about the value of wisdom and the and the and the road to wisdom, and so um, uh, a a new convert to Christianity, a child in a family, will need guidance like Proverbs gives for leaving their simplicity and moving into wisdom. If the fool, if the simpleton lives long enough, if if as we have seen his waywardness will murder him. <laughs> if it doesn't murder him, if he lives long enough to survive and is given no discipline, he will become a fool. The naive person who does not submit to discipline will become a fool. The status of folly has three subdivisions. The insensitive fool, what in Hebrew is called the kassil. The stubborn or morally insolent fool, what Hebrew calls avid. And the stupid fool, the nabal. Now, some of you seeing that word nabal here will immediately be thinking of a person in, character, in, in scripture. Yes yeah. or no? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't even pronounce the name that way. Uh, nabal. Nabal, yeah. Yeah. Abigail's husband. Yes, correct. And we'll refer to 1 Samuel 25 uh, substantially when we talk, to, uh, talk about the nabal. The first of this group, the insensitive fool, has six basic characteristics. In his character, he is unteachable. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. I knew a man a number of years ago who was in his 80s when I met him. Uh, he married my grandmother. Um, he was, she was widowed three times, and he was the third. But she, when she married him, he was... He was a nice man. He treated my children well, and he treated my grandmother very, very well. Uh, but he was um, not teachable. Uh, I was painting, doing a paint job for them, painting a, a, a building up behind their house. And he said, what, what kind of paint? I'm going to the store. What kind of paint do you want me to get? I said, well, I think oil paint will stand up better. Uh, to the weather than 
And I had been working as a painter for over a year at that point. I said, I think oil paint will stand up better to the weather, weather than latex paint will. Latex paint is water solid, soluble. Oil paint takes a much more wear. He said, they don't make oil paint anymore. And I said, Bill, I know they do because I've been painting for a year. He said, no, they don't make oil paint anymore. I said, Bill, I know they do. I, I'm a painter. Listen to me. They make oil paint. No, they don't make oil paint. It has lead in it. And it, it, uh, it, uh, children will eat the paint chips and they'll get lead poisoning and they'll die. <laughs> okay, get whatever you want. You know, <laughs> He knew better because he was 80 <laughs> than I did, who was a painter. Um, he was unteachable. And this is the kind of thing that you run into. How many times a, a day do you run into this kind of situation? In his unteachability, he's, he is complacent. He's perfectly happy with where he is and all the, the state of knowledge that he has. He has no heart for wisdom. He despises wisdom. When he, when he hits, when he runs into wisdom, he knows better than anybody else. And that wisdom is falling to him. And uh, I was explaining to him something, you know, I, I, was in, I, I was in the doctoral program at Dallas Seminary, and he was, he was bringing up some point in the Bible. And I said, well, Bill, it really goes this direction. Well, you just know everything. You know? <laughs> Because he did know everything. Uh, he was in his <laughs> 80s. <laughs> uh, he can't concentrate on wisdom. Uh, I, just, I, just can't, I just can't follow the argument here, is his argument. <laughs> he relies on his own understanding. He hates knowledge. Anybody who knows more than he does, he, he, he tries to undermine. He's unable to learn from experience. <laughs> <laughs> he's willfully blind to truth. He's unwilling to discipline himself and he doesn't respond even to harsh discipline. Um, discipline is an important thing. And there are two kinds of discipline in scripture, in scripture corrective discipline and punitary, dis puni punitive discipline. Um, God's discipline for us is never punitive. It's always corrective. Uh, the difference between punitive discipline and corrective discipline. Uh, does India have any um, capital punishment crimes that that merit capital punishment? Yes. Okay. I, I assume treason would be one. Is that true? Uh, please repeat, brother. Treason. I assume treason would be one uh, um, crime that would be high, uh, uh, capital punishment. Uh, I, I can't define that. But some other uh, things are there. You know, when you... If, if one of your soldiers... When you, if one of your soldiers gave state secrets to the Pakistani army... Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, when we I, not when I, hear about uh, capital punishment given to uh, the murderer or a rapist. Okay. All right. Um, we have similar standards here in our country. Um, when, I, when I carry out capital punishment, I don't care whether the, whether the condemned has repented from his crime or not, whether he learns anything whether he gains wisdom from the penalty or not, that's irrelevant. Uh, we're gonna put the man to death and I don't care whether he repents of his crime. Um, corrective discipline only is concerned with the issue of, of change in the evildoer. So with your children, you don't punish them because they were bad. You, you bring discipline into their life so that they will grow beyond their folly. And that's the problem with this uh, insensitive fool. The Casile can't learn from discipline. It's just not an option. The, the simpleton can, but the Casile can't. Uh, so he's gone beyond this. B, he, he abuses speech. He's deceitful. Um, even when he doesn't need to be. He's deceitful. He's a slanderer. He perverts truth. He will use truth 
and mix it with enough lie to make it a falsehood. But he'll, he'll mix. And by the way, the best lie has most truth in it. Never, never should you say about a preacher, well, he's wrong on this crucial point of doctrine, but he says so much else that's truth, we'll listen to him. You, you never do that. Um, the, the amount of the amount of arsenic in a in a bottle of milk <laughs> need need not be large to be dangerous. Not if it's ninety percent milk and ten percent arsenic, you don't drink the ninety percent and and screen out the ten. It's all mixed up together. You can't trust a bottle of milk that might have ten percent arsenic in it. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. Uh, so when somebody, I'm not here talking about somebody who disagrees with me over the timing of the return of Jesus. What I'm talking about is somebody who denies principal truths of the scripture, the deity of Christ, the full humanity of Christ, these kinds of things. The, we, we cannot tolerate them. Uh, I cannot tolerate somebody who teaches a prosperity gospel because it is false to the scriptures. Look at Proverbs here, what we're saying, brothers and sisters. In Proverbs, it's saying hardship is what teaches wisdom. You don't gain wisdom from prosperity. Look at the United States. We have not gained wisdom from prosperity. We have become fools in our prosperity. Uh, so the issue is that you can't simply say, well, he says so much that's good. I want to follow him, even though this other stuff, I don't, boy, it's just wrong. But this I want to follow. No, if he's, if he's willfully blind to the truth, if he, if he hates knowledge, if he is deceitful, as, as we've said, if he is deceitful, I'm sorry, here it is. If he's deceitful and perverts the truth, He's using the truth to sustain a lie. That's a casile. You can't tolerate such a person. He demonstrates his folly by his speech. We have, we have a saying here in, England, in America that depends entirely upon understanding a, 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 the, the, a pun. Let's make like a tree and, and leaf. Uh, a tree le leafs out in spring. Okay, all right. In America, we have spring and summer and, and fall and winter. Uh, so a, a tree leaves out in spring. So the, we're going to make like a tree and leaf. There's another cultural character, Biff, in a, from a movie in a, in a, from the 1980s. He said, let's make like a tree and get out of here. He was so lame in his understanding. He couldn't even understand what make like a tree and leaf meant. He, he, he just simply violated the whole point of the saying um, because he, is, he, is, uh, he demonstrates his folly by his speech. He's inept. He's dangerous, in fact, in his speech. Uh, Proverbs 26, 9, uh, he, he uses his, his, his uh, speech to destroy people. He's, he's dangerous in his speech. Third, he abuses his emotions. Do you know anybody who can't, who, when confronted with a difficult situation, doesn't just become anxious or, or uncomfortable, they go all the way to the extreme of panic. You know people like this? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you don't, and if you don't, that's good. <laughs> uh, there are people like this, he abuses his emotions. Uh, there is either utter, either there is boredom or there is utter bliss or there is horrible distress. There's nothing in between. And so he's, he, he abuses his emotions. He's marked by strife. He gives his, full vo his emotions full vent. Well, I'm just being honest. No, you're not. You're, you're abusing emotions. You're, you're wearing yourself out unnecessarily. You're damaging yourself by this. And third, he is an angry man. 
capital D, he ignores the consequences of his actions. He may know what the consequences are, but present gratification is more important than uh, the long-term effects of these things. E, he is morally deficient. He enjoys wickedness. He hates repentance. He can't withhold any pleasure from himself. He doesn't know when he's sinning. <laughs> you mean that sin? He might say to you, you mean that's wrong? Have you know anybody like this? I, I'm not asking for self-identification. I'm just asking, do you know anybody else like this? Uh, um, he's lax in paying vows to God. When, when he makes a vow to God, he doesn't fulfill it. Sixth, he is disloyal and unreliable. He despises his parents. He is unreliable and he's lazy. Uh, you might as well cut off your hand or cut your feet off as to send an insensitive fool on a, on a task because he's not going get, to get it done. He's not reliable. The consequences of his character, he will be punished. Uh, he will suffer shame. His complacency will, des will destroy him. And he causes harm to others, to his parents, to his friends, his employer, and to his society. Uh, for this kind of person, growth and wisdom requires a radical conversion. Proverbs 8.5. Look at this. I'm still in Proverbs 8.5 here. So Proverbs 8.5. Learn to be shrewd, you who are inexperienced. Develop common sense, you who are casilene. You in morally insensitive fools, you, 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 I'm sorry, uh, insensitive fools, learn sensitivity. And all you can do is have a radical conversion because nothing else is going to bring this to pass. So, so how do you get it? Only through a radical conversion. Um, the second kind of fool is the stubborn or morally insolent fool, the evil. He is insolent toward God. He's ignorant of God. He mocks at sin. He rejects sacrifice. He's enraged at God. He is hostile to God, Hosea 9, 7. He's morally insolent. He mocks at sin. Um, a uh, well-known lecturer, I had a recording of a well-known lecturer who was lecturing for a group in Europe number of years ago, and uh, uh, he was asking them, they were, a lot of the folks in the group were from Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Poland and so on, and, and he asked, uh, does the culture even talk about sin in your country anymore? And they said, no, they don't. They, he said, they, they said the only way they use the word sin is as a, as a, a funny word. Um, this is, this, is, this is moral insolence. This is where the American culture is now. Do not aspire to be like America. And do not aspire to all the prosperity that America has. It has destroyed us. Um, he mocks at sin. He rejects sacrifice. <coughs> He's enraged. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong list here. Mocks at sin. He's shrewd to do evil, but he's unskilled in doing good. <laughs> um, his folly itself is sin, uh, and he can't resist temptation. It is this, by the way, this is the part, this is the hard part, folks. Uh, do you know the, the verse that says, uh, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. It's this kind of folly. It's this Hebrew word here that, that I have in the notes, evelet. A child is born morally insolent and must be taught morality. Children are not moral. Uh, do you know the, chil the rules of... Uh, 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 chil the children's rules for toys. Do you? All that I can see is mine. No, sir. 
First rule is all that I can see is mine. Second rule, if I have nine toys and you have one, your one is mine. <laughs> um, third rule, if I want it, it's mine. <laughs> and there are others, there are many others. Well, this is morally, moral insolence, folks. This is just moral insolence. The reason you're laughing is because you have experienced this in the life of your own children. And if you can remember your childhood, you, you experienced it as a child yourself. <laughs> so, so we know these things to be true. Uh, so, so, but this is moral insolence and it's bound up in the heart of a child. And it's going to, it's going to take hard work in the parent to teach the child to give up that moral insolence, to pursue, get away from the gullibility that is part of being a child and to embrace wisdom. Uh, and the child is going to hate every step of it. My mother, I say, we, we talk about spanking in America. You talk about beating a child. My, my, my mother had a, a black belt in spanking. <laughs> Thompson, you got it immediately. Uh, <laughs> she used the black belt. <laughs> she, she, she would have been a judo master, black belt in spanking. And she was very skilled at using it. She said, my dad told me, don't spank him enough to make him angry, spank him enough to make him sorry. I became one of the sorriest children you would ever meet. She would send me to my room after being spanked <laughs> and tell me, don't come out of the room until you're sorry. And I, you know, I come out and say, Mother, I'm so sorry. And she, you said, she, you're not sorry you, you did wrong. You're just sorry you got caught. Go back in your room. You're not sorry yet. <laughs> so, but it's kind of like saying, um, uh, to, to get to my house, go down a particular road. And when you come to the last stop sign, turn left. Well, now, how do you know when you get to the last stop sign? You never know when you're sorry enough. And that was part of my problem growing up and uh, part of my problem in my adult life. But this is, this is the kind of thing, folks, you, you, you can't leave a child undisciplined. If you do, you are consigning that child to folly. Uh, and this isn't even a matter of coming to faith in Christ. This is a matter of simple, just, healthy human development. Obviously, to gain true wisdom, you must have the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord, Deuteronomy, makes the fear of the Lord synonymous with loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And Paul uses the category, he doesn't use the terminology, but he uses the category, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, as his definition of what faith is in Romans 10. So um, the child is born a fool who is, who is not yet entrenched in the folly. So we can discipline the folly out of the child, but we have to know the child, <laughs> our, our son, we could, we could spank him all day long and it wouldn't change his behavior. But we gave him, um, we, we learned him a little better later in his life. And I would give him, we had very little money when he was a child. And this, what, I, what I'm about to tell you doesn't sound like much, but it, it was the best we could do. We gave him 10 dimes. A, a dime is a 10 cent piece in America. Uh, we gave him 10 dimes, a stack of 10 dimes at the beginning of the week. And we said, now, here are the chores you have to do this week. It, when you forget to do this chore, then we take a dime away. And boy, he would work for that money. <laughs> so... So at the end of the week, they're yours, and you may have them, but and, and they're going to stay here in the kitchen where we can all see them, and I will we'll see if you've done if you've missed a chore, we'll take a dime away. Well, he that began to teach that boy discipline. Does this make sense? Spanking him didn't help. Uh, spanking is something that you receive you reserve for the most egregious, defiant behaviors. Don't do it for every behavior because it'll, it'll um, make the child lose hope. But discipline is gonna be for the future. You're making them look toward the future, to a goal they want to achieve in the future. 
But if Elliot, this moral insolence, uh, doesn't even think in those terms. He can't resist temptation. He's without understanding. I, I tease people and I say, I can stand, I can endure anything but temptation and pain. Other than that, I can put up with it. <laughs> that's, that's not true, but it, it's a, a way of teasing around here. C, he's without understanding. He can't discuss anything rationally. It's going to make a joke out of everything. He ignores the consequences of his deeds. Proverbs 7.23. He enjoys folly. And he, pre, he prejudges things. Uh, I've looked at this for 10 minutes, and I know what this is all about. And it's all, I've got it all figured out. And to, to disagree with me makes you stupid. Uh, and you're just stupid, and you, I, I'm not even going to listen to you. He prejudges things. He's a schemer. Always got some kind of plot working that's going to make him, get him to whatever goal he has. And every time it works out, it fails. It, it succeeds often enough to keep him, or, or well enough to keep him in this. But he's a schemer. Jacob. He, pardon? A Jacob. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's deceitful. He's rebellious. He hot-headedly abuses speech. He's most easily known by the speech. All through the ancient Near East, there is a, uh, there's a tradition of wisdom in Babylon, Assyria, in Egypt. Uh, you will perhaps remember, uh, and I can't now think of the passage at all, but the peoples of... Uh, Ammon and Moab were known as wise people. Uh, I can't think of the passage to save my life at this point. But um, common among all their views on wisdom is the Egyptian way of describing the wise man. The wise man is the silent one. The wise man is one who doesn't talk much. So you give yourself away by your speech. He most easily, he's most easily known by his speech. He likes to quarrel. Either he turns everything into a joke or he turns everything into, a, into an argument. He lashes out when he's offended. He acts and speaks impetuously. He gets angry quickly and he's impatient. H, he's, he's unteachable. He despises advice. He assumes he's always right. He despises wisdom and discipline. He's incorrigible. And that's crucial here. This, this one is not just one among many facts about this guy. This is crucial now. The, the, the uh, Cassil, the um, insensitive fool, can be corrected. This guy can't be corrected. There's no correction for him. He can't learn from experience. Uh, do you know the, the American definition of, of, of insanity? Have you heard this? The, the American definition, it's, it's intended to be a joke. Um, uh, Doing the, thing, the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. <laughs> uh, this, is this, this is this guy. He can't learn from experience. He, 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 he does something, gets in trouble. He does it again, gets in trouble. Does it again, gets in trouble. And the fault is yours, not mine. And he cannot obtain wisdom, Proverbs 24, 7. This character is usually associated with youth. youth. Proverbs 22, 15 is the verse that I cited earlier. Folly is bound up, evelet, moral, moral insolence is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. The rod of discipline there is not a prescription for way of dealing with a child. It is the maximum penalty. Uh, the consequences of his character, he will be a servant to the wise. He will be punished. Unfortunately, it doesn't come soon enough for those whom he hurts. 
he will come to ruin. And again, unfortunately, this doesn't come soon enough for those whom he hurts. Um, D, he will die because of his lack of judgment. He hurts himself and others with his words, and he will be perverted more and more. Proverbs holds out no hope for change in him. There's no place for him to go. He is, he is going to be a fool the rest of his life. And if he lives long enough, if he doesn't die in his folly, he will become a stupid fool, the Nabal or the Naval in Hebrew. His speech, he speaks nonsense. He thinks it's terribly wise and very, very cute, but he speaks nonsense. He lies. He speaks without understanding. He cannot speak with excellence. Uh, I heard, we had a president at the college a number of years ago who was a, a lawyer by profession. And he gave a speech in chapel one day, and I heard eloquence, and I appreciate eloquence. Um, he was eloquent. The, the stupid fool tries to be eloquent, and he just comes off looking terrible. His spiritual life, he ignores God. Brothers and sisters, there is no sin that is more serious than treating God as irrelevant. Look at Psalm 14. In fact, look at Psalm 10. That actually ought to be in that passage. Psalm 10. Um, verse 2 and verse 11 are the ones I'm interested in here. Psalm two, uh, 10, verse 2. In arrogance, the wicked relentlessly pursue their victims. This is right. Uh, hmm. Oh, it's verse 4. Psalm 10, verse 4. In all his scheming, uh, the, this, this is the CSB. Another way of reading this is, in all his thought, the arrogant, the, the wicked person arrogantly, arrogantly thinks there is no accountability since there's no God. I, the CSB has, has overinterpreted this too much here. And, and this is not a psalm I worked on. This I did work on Psalms 52 to 101 in, in the, uh, the Christian Standard Bible. But um, this one I, I don't think is handled well. Um, but NKJV is different, brother. Yeah, it is. And NKJV doesn't talk about that. In all his thoughts, there is, a, 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 I mean, now I can't even quote it. Um, let me grab another translation and look at it properly. Psalm 10, 4. Um, in the pride of his countenance, the wicked say, God will not seek it out. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Now, I want you to understand this is a much better translation here of that verse. I want you to understand this, this is not someone denying the existence of God. Um, verse, verse 11 will make that clear. They think in their heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. I can get away with anything because God does pay attention. God's not relevant to life, and there is no sin more wicked than treating God as if he's irrelevant to life. Um, none of the sins that we preach against is as wicked as that. Are you with me on this? The God who keeps your brain working so that you will remember to breathe and your heart will beat. Yes. cannot be irrelevant. So to treat him as irrelevant is the most wicked thing that anybody can do. And you will, you will perhaps deal with the lost and say, they will say, well, I, I don't, I'm not an enemy of God. I'm not a sinner. I don't do anything bad. And you will say, well, how often 
do you relate what you're doing to the living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? And you say, well, I never even think about him. Well, what, what's more wicked than that? That's the most wicked thing one can do, to ignore God. And it's an indication of um, morally, how do we describe that? The novel, the stupid fool. So most of the people we meet on a day-to-day -day basis are stupid fools. He refuses to worship God. He denies God. He curses God. Speaks error against the Lord. And you, from number six, you'd go back to the morality of the man. Seventh, he practices idolatry. Uh, and there are Christian idolaters. <laughs> because there are people who think God is other than he actually is. When I treat God other than he, as, as being other than he actually is, I am in effect an idolater. Um, yeah. So he practices idolatry, claims God's leading for his folly. He transgresses Torah, 2 Samuel 13, 12, 13, Judges 20, 10. He doesn't trust God. His morality, he inclines toward wickedness. He practices ungodliness. He withholds help from the needy. He does not practice what's good. I don't know in India. I can't sort out in my mind um, how to do what you do, uh, what you do regularly in India. And I've seen you do it on many occasions. The poor... Uh, are everywhere and the destitute are everywhere and you carry coins around to give to them how, how I don't know how you how, how how you do that and do all the other things that you do I, I, I commend you for it um, once once you give to a mission organization in the United States you start getting mailings from every other mission organization <laughs> they share their their mailing lists and i can't support every mission how, what do i do and how do i how do i deal with this i commend you i that do you ever feel what's the word i want <laughs> conflicted by saying i i just can't give um I, I'm 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 impressed with you. It, it is a mark of the work of God in your lives that you are doing these things. Um, we don't we don't confront uh, uh, poverty in the way you do in America, but uh, the the Nabal, the stupid fool, withholds help from the needy. He does not practice what's good. He's corrupt. He breaks covenant by adultery, by ignoring the claims of, of chesed, loyalty, love. Uh, that's, a, that's a concept you need to have some background on. and I'm, I can't take time to deal with that in this study. He seeks only his own pleasure. He cannot subordinate his pleasure to the demands of righteousness. And he seeks luxury. Capital D, his social relations. He, he ignores social convention. <laughs> um, Bob Long Sukumar, uh, Bob Long and I hurt Dr. Spurgeon badly one evening. Uh, we were going to dinner and we invited him to go with us. And he said, no, I'm going to stay here. I need to do something here. So we asked him again, well, come on, why don't you go with us? We'll... <laughs> He said, uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll stay here. So we went to dinner and came back and found out that he was hurt because we didn't ask him the third time. Because if we had really wanted him to go, we would have asked him three times. And we didn't know that. That was, that was a matter of, of that, that wasn't ignoring social convention. It was simply not being aware of what he expected and so we hurt him badly. And, and we would, he is a man whom we never would want to hurt. We, we want to honor him in every way, but uh, we ended up hurting him uh, utterly against our will 
but uh, but the the stupid fool knows social conventions and ignores them completely. He's worthless. I, I don't want to say that about anybody, but the scripture does. For Samuel 25, 25. This is what Abigail says about her husband, Nabal. Uh, he's untrustworthy. He withholds help from the needy. And again, 1 Samuel 25 is, is in view here. He's unwilling to acknowledge a benefit. Um, he's unthankful. And he returns evil for good. The consequence of his character is he grieves his parents. Proverbs 20, 17, 21. He will die. He cannot be tolerated. He is hated by those who encounter him. Uh, if, if you could turn off your mic, mic uh, when you're speaking, uh, cannot be tolerated. He, he's hated by those who encounter him. He and, and boy, I don't know why the E is there. There's something happened there. I've got to correct. Uh, so I'll, I'll highlight that. I'll come back and correct that later. He causes his associates shame and he endangers his associates. Uh, folks, if the morally insolent fool cannot be changed, then the Nabal can't either. Finally, and the bottom of the whole, we've been coming from the top, the wise to the simple, to three kinds of fool, to now the scoffer, the scorner. This is the bottom of the whole uh, list. Scoffing is his most basic personal trait. In Isaiah 28, 14, and 22, the people that Isaiah is talking about are described as men of scoffing. Uh, in 1 Samuel 25, 25, she calls uh, Abigail, I believe it's right, she calls him a son of worthlessness. Do you know what it means to be the son of something in the Old Testament or in the New? Barnabas is the son of comfort. Do you remember this? Yeah. What do you know what it means to be the son of something? He's equal. Pardon? He's not physical at all. Uh, to, to be the son of, com of comfort for Barnabas meant that he is marked by the trait of comforting most uniquely. He is simply, that's him. If you want to capsulize the character of Barnabas, he's a comforter, an encourager. To call the sons of Eli sons of worthlessness, anshebeliyaal, uh, means that they, there is no value in them. They have abandoned everything that's value in life, valuable in life. They are worthless. He loves scoffing. So, so this guy, uh, they are sons of the tongue in Isaiah 28, 14, and 22. But that's what a novel, a, a lates is. He is a son of a tongue. He loves scoffing. He's classed with the ruthless and the wicked. Scoffing is the opposite of humility. It is proud and haughty. He is filled with overweening pride. Does not listen to rebuke. He hates reproof. He curses anyone who would discipline him. He's contentious and full of shamefulness. He despises God's word through his ambassador, the prophet. He inflames others with, un, with his unrestrained, unrestrained wrath, and he can't find wisdom. Consequences of his character, he, he is the ultimate loser from his way of life. Continuing, continued mocking brings un, increased punishment, Isaiah 28, 22. He will perish in the day of the Lord, and he is an abomination to all mankind. There is no instruction for the stupid fool. I'm sorry, for the uh, uh, yeah stupid fool. There is no instru instruction about them. The scoffer. Shun scoffers. Avoid rebuking scoffers. You, you won't gain anything by it. You'll get in trouble. You'll be beaten by the scoffer for giving him rebuke. Um, 
When he is punished, the naive gains in shrewdness. Notice it's only the naive, the fool doesn't. Uh, the ability to live wisely, they, they gain shrewdness here. This is the word that's used in Proverbs 1 for what the, what the simpleton needs is shrewdness. Being able to walk, to, to, to be canny, to be uh, discerning, and know how to know how to conduct yourself in a given situation. You must drive them out. And I'm sorry, drive out a scoffer. This should be here. Uh, don't know how that got on that other line there. Um, now, these are these are the major characters of the book of Proverbs. And you could multiply references on this. Um, but as I say in the notes here, it may now occur to you that you don't wish to follow the path of folly with its end in scoffing and death. <laughs> Whoever wishes to avoid such an end must follow the path to wisdom and life. But Job asked in Job 28, 28, where can wisdom be found? So to find wisdom, one must follow the proper course for only the, the divinely ordained pathway can wisdom be found. Um, it is of first importance that those who seek wisdom be convinced of its value. They will be willing to pay the price to get it. So the benefits of finding wisdom, um, it's blessings to the wise. You get the Lord's favor, life, peace, happiness, security, wealth, honor, power, healing, hope for the future, brings the knowledge of God, and opens up the world for understanding. It brings blessing for others. It not only has benefits for you, let me say this about these, these categories here. Um, I just talked badly about the prosperity gospel, and then now I have wealth here and power. Yes? So what is this talking about? It's under the Mosaic Covenant. This, the book of Proverbs is written under the Mosaic Covenant, which promises these things to people who pursue the Lord. And you see David, and you see Solomon, and you see Hezekiah and others who, who pursued wisdom and gained these kinds of things. But this is not what the New Testament promises. I'm talking to you now about the Old Testament way to wisdom. It brings blessings for others, uh, it makes others wise, brings a stable home life, edifies others, and it protects others. A wise man in a, in a town is better than a hundred warriors, so better than a wall for the town, because a wise man will know how to protect the, 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 the town without uh, soldiers. The value of wisdom, it is, it is of supreme value. It is worth all a person has. It is more precious than gold, silver, and pearls, coral, crystal, onyx, and sapphires. To gain wisdom is better than to gain all that. Gold can be stolen. Wisdom cannot. Wisdom can be found by those who seek it as God provides it. The answer of Proverbs is Proverbs itself is intended to teach wisdom. It's also given by God. Uh, this is the point in Proverbs 2.6 that we looked at last week or two weeks ago. It requires something of the one who wants it, attention and concentration, total commitment of all one's possessions. It may cost you everything you, get, you have to get it, but everything you have is worth getting wisdom because wisdom is worth more than all you have. It may take all of your life to gain it. It's an incessant search. It takes obedience, humility, physical discipline, Submission to reproof, submission to all the things we dislike, uh, the submission to discipline and reproof and instruction. It requires godliness. You cannot get wisdom if you're not godly. It is rooted in the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the presupposition and first principle of wisdom. That's what the beginning of wisdom probably means in uh, the passages cited. Wisdom is gained when one searches for it persistently, greedily, with hard work, when one is as familiar with it as he is with his own wife and family. That's how you gain wisdom. Proverbs 7, 4. 
New Testament answer. Jesus Christ is the source of wisdom. Wisdom is from God. This wisdom is described in 1 Corinthians 1 as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. I have revised and revised and revised this thing, and I still find errors in it. I apologize, folks. Um, wisdom here, this wisdom is not going to get you rich, make you rich on earth. <clears throat> righteousness, sanctification, and redemption are costly to, to God, and they're costly to us, too. You don't gain righteousness by ease. You gain righteousness by suffering, unfortunately. Jesus is the source because he is truly God, uh, the fullness of deity, Colossians 2.9. Therefore, he is the source of all wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. The means of acquiring wisdom in Christ, we are made complete and given new resurrected life. We practice. So, so what was required for the, the, uh, the casil uh, was a complete conversion in life. And this we have in Christ. Um, the means of acquiring wisdom, we are made complete, we're given new resurrected life. We practice wisdom by progressive sanctification or wise living, Colossians 3, 5 to 14, crucial passage on wisdom in the New Testament. Putting off the old, we have died and must consider ourselves dead. We are, we are to put aside the old ways because we have put aside the old life. Why would you live the old life? Suppose you became an American citizen. Would you continue <clears throat> to live as if you're under the laws of India? <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense, would it? If I were to become an, a, a citizen of India, they would not let me. I'm not Hindu. But if I were to become a citizen of India and try to live like an American, then I would get in all kinds of trouble. Yes? You, you've seen Americans, you know what we do, <laughs> and you tolerate us because you, you know we're, our, you're, you're, we're brothers, but uh, we, I just can't live that way anymore. I, I'm not a member of, of uh, I'm not a citizen of the United States anymore. I'm a citizen of India. I've got to live as an Indian lives. This means um, uh, so we, we, putting on also, not, not only putting off, but putting on the new, Colossians 3, 10 to 14, we have put on the new man, we must put on the new, its new ways. The application here, then, there are similarities in Old Testament and New Testament wisdom. The call to wisdom is addressed to all, Proverbs 8, 1 to 4, John 7, 7 37, 38. The issue is one of life and death in both cases, Proverbs 8, 35 and 36, John 3, 36 and 14, 6. The basis is faith, Proverbs 3, 5 to 7, and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. That's probably Psalm 37, but it's close to Psalm 3, uh, Proverbs 3, John 3, 16 to 18. Differences between the two, Proverbs presents precepts, the New Testament presents a person. Proverbs gives particulars, the New Testament, the pattern and the power. Um, now, as, as Bruce Waltke says, in Christ is greater wisdom than in Proverbs. But if Proverbs is a $5 bill and, and Christ is a $100 bill, still don't throw away the $5 bill. <laughs> See? <laughs> Are you with me here? Yes? So that, so that the wisdom that's in Proverbs is not the same wisdom, not identically the same wisdom as in the New Testament, but it's still wisdom and it's still from God and it still entails the fear of God, fear of the Lord. So I retain that, but seek the higher wisdom, knowing that in seeking the higher wisdom, I will also achieve the lower wisdom. So finally, in this discussion, uh, Proverbs 4, 7, 
Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. And that's the summation of what I have to say about the book of Proverbs. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll move. And I, I don't remember, have I, have I said what we will go to next week? In no. the past, did we give a, an order? I'd like to go to yeah. Ecclesiastes. Say again. Yes. I did. What did what did I say? It, it is Ecclesiastes only, sir. Okay. Next week. So, yeah. so we'll go to Ecclesiastes next week. Yeah. Uh, it would be good to reread Ecclesiastes. And as you do, if you if you take time to reread Ecclesiastes this week, um, watch four places where Ecclesiastes is at odds with the book of Proverbs. Because <laughs> uh, it is. Could you repeat? That, could you repeat the sentence? Yes. Watch for places in Ecclesiastes that are at odds with the book of Proverbs. Because it is at odds with the book of Proverbs. And we're going to have to address that. What, what's going on? Um, what, are, what are we talking about here? And uh, Ecclesiastes is a tough book. But it's, boy, it's important. Golly, it's important. Then, then the last three weeks of our study, we'll turn to the book of Job and, and, uh, and work with it to the extent that we can in the four and a half hours we'll have to work together. All right. What questions do you have about Proverbs now that we've gone this far? Uh, one question, uh, Dr. Alman. Yes, sir. When we, when we were uh, discussing about the folly of the, uh, the children, it's not only in children we find sometimes in ourselves and in your elderly <laughs> person self. That's true. <laughs> Isn't, Isn't that's it? true. That's, that's why I dislike teaching this material. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things we are talking about children, we carry until now sometimes. I, at least in right. my life, I find. I don't that's know. right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. There's, there's a, a, uh, a story that's told. I may have used this in the past. I, I apologize for repetition, but the story is told about uh, a, a, a school who's trying to hire a teacher. And uh, they have two candidates, one who has one year of teaching experience and one who has 20 years. Did I use this before? Uh, we didn't, yeah. And... Uh, uh, they decided to hire the, the teacher who had only one year of experience. Mm -hmm. And the teacher with 20 years of teaching background came in to the principal and said, what is wrong with you? You hire this young thing right out of college, has only one year of experience, and I've been teaching for 20 years. I have all this experience behind me. And the principal said, well, you have to understand the, the other teacher has only one year of experience. So do you. You've just repeated that one year of experience 20 times, <laughs> which is to say you've not learned anything from the last 20 years. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Brother Anthony, this is precisely the issue that you were raising. Here I am in my, I'm going, I'm, I'm crowding 74 pretty hard now. And uh, I have uh, one year of experience repeated 74 times. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Any other, any sir, other questions? One question. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 14. Okay. He who blesses his friend with a loud voice, <laughs> rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. What, <laughs> what kind of blessing is that? I probably would have to study that in order to give a, a sound answer. My guess is... Uh, this is the kind of thing Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6, where the Pharisees blow trumpets on the corner so that everybody can see them giving their gifts to the poor. And they're doing this to be seen by men. And I, I think maybe it's the same kind of thing. It's 2417, you say? No, yeah. 24. 2714. 2714, yes. Okay. I got all the right numbers just in the wrong places. Um, uh, 27, 14. Let me look at it here. 
yeah, I'm, that's the best I can do with it off the top of my head. Um, but uh, we, we have another saying, brother, which is not intended to be a slight to you. It's supposed to be a joke. Uh, any fool can ask a question that a, a wise man can't answer. <laughs> which is to say, I'm trying to hide behind my years of experience and knowledge instead of actually coming up with a sound answer. <laughs> so, Did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel I'm not that uh, morally fool. <laughs> I know this can be really brutal. <laughs> uh, and, and as I'm going through these things, I'm thinking, this is me, this is me, this is me. <laughs> I, I, I have the same experience you have. So good. Any other questions? Well, is Brother Timothy still on the on the? Uh, yes, oh, Doctor. Yes, right. Doctor. No, well, I'll turn it over to you if there are no more questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, dear friends, please uh, feel free to ask questions if you have any, or else uh, maybe we can call it a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, feel free to ask if you if you yeah really have any questions. I never did quit sharing that that document, did I? Sir, we have a question. Yes. Uh, I mean, the date, of, like tentative date, when the, the Proverbs were written by Solomon. Oh my goodness, I don't know, brother. Um, Was it are... uh, before his? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, he worshipped the other gods. I don't know. <laughs> Any clue? Uh, all I can say is I, I don't have any information by which to make a decision. Wow. I, I can't figure out how to quit sharing this document. Um, I can't get back to the whole screen. Yeah. Zoom. Uh, can the host do it? Can the host stop? Perhaps. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, in the meanwhile, we'll see. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. if there are any other questions, we can take. Otherwise, uh, we'll sign off. Here I'm out. Okay. Yes, you're, yes, no, no. Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you, okay. Dr. Alman, once again uh, mm -hmm. for the evening. And and maybe I'll ask uh, 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 Sukumar uncle to close this in prayer and then we'll disperse. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, valuable time that we could spend with Dr. Alman. Thank you, Lord, for the way he labored so much to prepare this lesson and uh, teach us, oh, Father. Help us to reread the material and learn more things so that Lord will be able to grow into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ and be useful for his ministry. Thank you for everything that you are doing through him and we thank you for Prabh Timothy who is taking all the pains to arrange all, everything of Father. We commit all the participants into, into your hands. May we all with oneness of spirit uh, lead and uh, and uh, work for you in jesus name we pray amen